As you might uh, just have gathered by my uh, rather natty dress attire, this is not your uh, average motoring test in Britain. So, after an all-day flight, I've ended here in the uh, Sinai Desert, Egypt. Long journeys in the desert demand one thing, transport that is totally reliable and that can run on absolutely precious fuel for miles and miles. Perhaps like the camel. No, this is my transport for the desert, Peugeot's brand new 406 HDI diesel. Let's go and see how it measures up. So, Peugeot reckon this is one of the quietest diesel engines around. So let's just put it to the test. Well, first to second is undeniably a diesel. Third similar. Fourth gear, we're talking about petrol levels of sound. This is more than acceptable. Acceleration, especially in the mid-range, is good. Uh, th this new engine has definitely improved the low down torque. It's a car that's got a reasonable degree of performance. Key thing about this new engine is it's called common rail diesel. Diesels are seriously important business for Peugeot. They've made a staggering 8 million in the last 20 years. With a 406, they've sold 600,000 so far, 53% of which have been diesels. So this engine is very important to the Peugeot range. From a comfort point of view, you've got very supportive seats. Steering position is excellent. Dash is well laid out. A bit too much gray plastics for my liking, but everything's in the right place, and it's a pretty nice driving environment. So, diesels are definitely more economical than petrol, but what they like to drive and own? Well, as far as I'm concerned, this car drives remarkably like a petrol. It is perfectly acceptable for day-to-day -day driving. Now it's time to try out the second car on this test, the Partner 4x4, Peugeot's off-road workhorse van out in the desert. So what do we think of the Peugeot Partner? First thing is, it is categorically a van with windows. A very, very good van with windows. If you look in the back, it is a great work tool. You could see somebody using its seats down as a perfect truck to take things around in. Then come the weekend, seats back up, wife and the kids in, and it's your perfect family saloon. So the Peugeot 4x4. What's it like off-road, or on desert, more to speak? Well, it seems to handle all the bumps we've had and the terrain very well so far. It's not what you would call a pedigree 4x4, Range Rover or your Land Cruiser, but it's pretty adequate for uh, your average punter getting you out of the odd snow drift, stuck in a bit of mud or through some floods. It will do a competent job in what most of us will come across. I've seen some wacky things in my time all over the world, but blue rocks in the middle of the desert? Apparently some mad Belgium artist, God knows how he got here, what he was doing here, suddenly decided that the desert needed a bit of colour. So he went around everywhere painting things blue. I guess this is what they call the blues. Mad. We're on our way to evening camp, a Bedouin village. They've just told me I've got 91 miles of this. And I have to be honest, I'm not looking forward to it at all. I don't believe this. I have just been informed that it in fact is not 90 k's to the little desert bivouac, but 130, and the road has just become a motorway of cobblestones. I have now had desert up to here and beyond. I think I have now fully tested this vehicle. It performs very well. If you could hear that, that was whacking over another bloody giant rock. I've had enough. At last, 
We appear to have finally reached our Bedouin village. It's very dark. It's all a bit spooky. I was expecting five-star luxury, not this. I always hated tents. What drivers really want to know about diesels is what cost savings can the average driver make with this new engine? If I take the example of the two-litre engine that you just drove today, um, if you compare it with the previous engine of uh, um, slightly higher uh, cubic capacity, the consumption will be reduced by approximately 30%. To, to be more precise, for a driver who would drive uh, uh, 60,000 miles in three years, it would mean an economy of approximately 1,200 pounds. Martin, what are the real benefits of common rail diesel engines? Yeah, I'm afraid it would be a little bit complicated to, to, to describe, but in two words, it's a way to uh, improve the combustion, combustion uh, by uh, um, um, increasing the pressure at which the uh, diesel comes in the cylinder. It is without doubt the worst night's sleep I've ever had. The Entente Cordiale was nothing. I had to the right of me and the left of me two Frenchmen who could have snored Olympic style. It has been an unmitigated disaster. Vital for the desert, especially when there is only a hole in the ground, toilet paper, this is not a camera shot. End of my uh, desert drive, my verdict on the two, the partner, it's a workhorse. It probably won't come to the UK. If it does, it'll be limited sales. Small businessmen doubling it up as a car at the weekend. 406, new diesel engine, much improved. Better economy, better performance, better on the environment. It's a good package. It's not quite there yet, but it's well on the way. Right, I've had enough of wearing tea cosies, pretending to be Lawrence of Arabia. What I need is luxury, five star pampered luxury. I have to get to the hotel. Where are the keys? I don't believe this. Well, actions must. I've got to get to that hotel. So off we go. Golden Venice. So the desert adventure is finally over. I've covered a thousand or so miles of desert, swallowed half of the sand, but now I have to admit the cars are parked away and I am really looking forward to an afternoon by the pool. So it's goodbye from sunny Egypt. See you shortly. In a world that's packed with every kind of car you can imagine, Honda have decided to invent a new one for us. They've called it the HRV. So what exactly is it? Take two parts compact city car, add an equal measure of sports utility vehicle, throw in a large pinch of hatchback, estate and four wheel drive. Blend well and garnish with plenty of accessories. There you have it, Honda's recipe for creating a brand new concept of vehicle that they hope will send the youngsters wild. Yes, Honda have realised that not many young people buy their cars, so they're aiming the HRV at the Dinkies. Double income, no kids yet. Or the Sinkies, just the same, but only one income. Well, tempted or not, what do you actually get for your money? Well, this is the only version of the HRV on sale yet. It's the 1.6 and it comes with four wheel drive. Now, this 1.6 engine is extremely economical and also produces very low emissions. It's just under 14 grand and you get a choice of manual or a CVT, which is Honda's automatic gearbox. The HRV comes with the high levels of spec that we know and we love in a Honda. Things like power steering, air conditioning, dual airbags and a full electrics package all come as standard on this vehicle. Spending some time in the HRV makes you realise that it is actually a very clever optical illusion. 
Now it certainly outside doesn't have the on-road presence of one of those huge off-roaders, but once you get inside you really do feel like you could be in a 4x4. There are very clever design touches, things like the open windows that give you a great commanding view on the road. And take a look at these wing mirrors, they're absolutely huge. They really are the kind of thing you'd find in a much larger vehicle. Now because it isn't a true 4x4, that of course benefits the on-road handling and the ride. It feels great, you feel like you could be in a car. The automatic CVT gearbox, which features in this version, is great. It's really nice and smooth. The automatic fans and the grannies out there are going to love it, but it isn't going to excite a real motoring enthusiast. But don't worry, because there's plenty more real technology featured with some very impressive names. Things like Multimatic Transmission, Prosmatic Control, Electronic Brake Force Distribution and Dual Pump Four Wheel Drive. Now the dual pump is actually a very clever system. It's an intelligent four-wheel drive. It only sends the power through to the rear wheels as well when it's absolutely necessary. Now the only problem I can see is that only 93% of off-roaders actually go off-road. So I don't know if the 4x4 system in this vehicle will see a lot of action. And again, as usual in a Honda, there are plenty of safety features packed in. Things like G-Force control technology and a special kind of body shell that means should you inadvertently hit a few pedestrians they won't get hurt quite as bad as they would have done before. Do you know it's funny I've been trying all day to find somebody to test that feature out for me. Couldn't find one person willing. Oh well. Those of us familiar with Honda's work of course know they're a solid sensible company who take their technology and their cars very very seriously. Quite terrifying then to read the word funky in the HRV's press pack. Even more frightening the words urbane, cool and futuristic. Personally I reckon the HRV looks less catwalk cool and more tarts handbag. You'll find alloys, flared arches, spoilers, two-tone upholstery, two-tone interior, lots and lots of bright blue dials. Inside there's loads of room for passengers and all their stuff. There are so many cubby holes and storage spaces in this vehicle that you're absolutely guaranteed to forget where you put your sunglasses. Oh well. Now, Honda are one of those companies well known for their technological advances and they haven't let us down on the HRV. They've come up with something new. The removable ashtray, voila! It simply pops out of its position and can be replaced in any one of the five cup holders you'll find in the HRV. Very clever. Without a doubt, the HRV is going to make plenty of new friends. It's quirky, it's great fun to drive, and of course, it's a Honda, so everything will work every single day. But I've got to say that although we know we should buy a car that's fun, sensible, and extremely reliable, I'm afraid that Faint Heart never won Fur Maiden, because what I really want is a car that's bad, that's bold, and that makes my pulse race. Despite the fact that oil is now as cheap as it's been for many years at around 10 US dollars per barrel, we don't see much evidence of that at the petrol pumps. So this car is an interesting alternative. Citroen have introduced a bi-fuel car to its Zara and Xantia range and this is the Xantia 1.8 bi-fuel. Petrol and LPG, liquid propane gas, and you can switch between the two at just the press of a button. We're driving in petrol mode at the moment, and if I press this, it takes just five seconds to switch between the two. But if you're driving, you have no experience of it switching at all. It's totally seamless. Using LPG as a fuel is certainly environmentally friendly, cleaner emissions, and it's just half the cost of petrol. But then again, what's the point if there are so few places to fill up with LPG in this country? Let's ask Julian Layton from Citroën. 
The important thing is that we are at the moment looking into the possibility of bringing in an LPG vehicle and you're quite right there are so few places today but the momentum is really growing fast. I know a lot of the fuel companies have got a major program to increase the number of LPG sites and we believe that once the infrastructure has grown then you know, we've got an ideal proposition to introduce to the UK market here. Now Citroen is the only company that makes LPG cars from scratch, isn't that right? We were the first um, and in fact um, with uh, certain markets in mainland Europe um, producing, uh, selling a lot of, of LPG vehicles, in particular Italy and Holland, um, there has been a good market already on, on mainland Europe. And uh, yes, we've had the Xantia LPG vehicle available for nearly two years now, and uh, very successfully so. Technically, what's the trick? How does it switch between petrol and LPG? The petrol engine remains largely unaltered, so you can actually run the vehicle on petrol all of the time. But over and above that, the LPG supply feeds into the engine via an electronic control unit. And it's that control unit that will determine when to switch from petrol, which it always starts on, to LPG and to monitor and control the whole system efficiently. In a way you're ahead of the field aren't you? Because there are a few places to, to fill up, um, it, it, you can provide the vehicle but you can't provide the sites to fill up which is a bit of a shame really isn't it? It's chicken and egg situation but uh, I think you know, realistically some people have got to break that mould and uh, we're ready, willing and able with Xantia once that, uh, that infrastructure starts to grow and I think it's, it's very encouraging to see the number of, uh, of new stations which are beginning to take LPG. But the important thing, as I mentioned just now, is that with this you're not, uh, you're not constrained to purely LPG so that if anybody's worried about lack of LPG sites, they can run it as an ordinary petrol vehicle and uh, just as easily. Now, I've been writing about cars and presenting them on television for more years than I care to remember, and it's sometimes difficult to work up enthusiasm when you think you've seen it all before. But this is one story where I have no problems at all, because this is the Ronart. Ronart Cars goes back to the mid-80s when Arthur Wollstonehome built the first W152. Since then, he's never looked back. This a machine. So, um, Arthur, tell me, how did Ron Art start? I was very interested in the Grand Prix cars of the 1950s, and to me, that era of the front-engine cars was the one I was looking towards um, creating. And uh, so you just went off and built yourself a motor car? Yes, I studied some books on, uh, on a lot of the engineering aspects and uh, just set about designing the car that I really wanted. And, and did it, was it right from the word go? I think the style and the, uh, and the engineering aspects, yes, it was. I was very pleased with the prototype car, uh, how it ran and how it uh, performed. And you've, you've still got that prototype? Yes, indeed, yes. I, I've been driving it uh, for the last 12 years and uh, I've reached something like 80,000 miles in it. Um, it's been very satisfying and it's been excellent motoring. You can buy it in kit form? No, the car's available in component form for the enthusiast to build, but it's also uh, available built by the factory to customer specification. Uh, how much would a, a fully built-up car cost if you bought it from the works? In kit form, uh, the customer could put one on the road. If he had his donor car, which is an XJ6, he could actually get the car on the road for £12,000. So how much would um, a rough old donor XJ cost you? Oh, anything from £100 to £150 uh, for one that's non-running that we could use most of the mechanics out of. If you build the car and, uh, and sell it to a customer, how much does it cost then? Well, for a high spe specification car that we would build, it costs from £24,000 upwards. If you're going to drive something like this, you might as well look the part. First impression is of build quality. The car feels totally unlike a lashed together kit car. It's big and solid, all the controls feel like a Jaguar's should, and the steering is light and free from kickback. 
And despite the massive weight of that V12 engine, it's actually quite nicely balanced with 50-50 weight distribution. I wasn't going to push that hard in a car that a customer has taken a year to build, but a lot of Ronarts equip themselves well on the track in sprints and hill climbs. And if it was mine, that's where I'd be headed. I've driven some mad creations in my time, but <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> and the reason it's such an amazing car, because under the bonnet here, 5.3 litres of Jaguar V12, they put six twin choke Weber carburettors on it. It's producing about, I don't know, let's say 350 brake horsepower, and it won't be too far wrong. 0 to 60, under 5 seconds, and maximum speed, well, how brave are you, and how well can you withstand the blue bottles on your teeth? They've had one up to 180 miles an hour, but that would take a substantially braver man than me. But in a car weighing less than a tonne, you can see why this is serious supercar performance. Well, it's not often I finish a car test saying I really want one, but I have to confess I'm seriously impressed by the Ronart. Let's think, a uh, second-hand old XJ6 for 250 quid, couple of spanners, pair of pliers, kit from Ronart. Yeah, I could do that. 